Welcome to Show Studio. It's our first roundup of the season and what a good city to start with because it's the most exciting one, I think, when it comes to menswear because it's London, our native home city. Um, we're going to be unpicking the highs and the lows and the changes and the developments that we've saw across this season's London Collections Men. Um, I've got a great set of panellists with me um, from different aspects of the industry, which is really nice, uh, to help discuss what we saw on the runways. Um, so before we start our discussion, I'll let you guys kick things off with an introduction, starting with you, Alex. I'm Alex Fiore, I'm the fashion editor of The Independent. And I'm Steve Sorter, I'm head of socials at ID and London menswear geek. <laughs> And I am Patrick Grant, I'm the creative director at eTorts and Northman Sons. I'm a judge on the Great British Sewing Bee. <laughs> You're such a nerd. You should have said geek as well. We start tonight, <laughs> that's why I'm doing it. <laughs> wow. Well, actually, we've got the eTorts show open because obviously, Patrick, you showed at London Collection. Mm -hmm. So firstly, congratulations on a very Thank beautiful you. show. Um, tell me a little bit about the experience, because it's interesting, because when we talk on these panels, we often talk about the experience of viewing a show. But tell mm. me a little bit about what it's been like as a designer showing at London Collection's Men and seeing it grow and grow and grow. Do you feel like it's even more of a presence than ever? Yeah, I mean, I think some of you will all remember I think there was an afternoon. I think we, there were mm. three shows. There was yeah. Man and Us, and I think Tim saw, and, and that was it. And then it became a full afternoon, and then a day, and then it was a day for three, three seasons. Yeah. This has been, you know, this was easily the most, um, the best attended of all of them. I think the yeah. international press presence here was way bigger even than last season, which was a big jump on the season Absolutely. before. We saw far more buyers coming to London. I mean, I think now the, the press come, but what we don't do is see an awful lot of the, the, the more commercial aspect of it. And um, so we all have to trog off to Paris yeah. to sell. Um, we have seen more buyers coming through London. Um, it felt really, it felt very slick. It felt, you know, I managed to get from mine to a couple of other shows. And, um, it, you know, you, you've, you've sensed a really, really positive um, vibe amongst the, I hate that word. You look at me really well, like, I'm not don't use the word vibe. I'm not like, <laughs> like Kanye. Yeah. I'm just building up to vibe. Um, <laughs> but um, it just felt like there was a lot of, you know what's really lovely about it is that I think because we've all grown up as sort of emerging designers um, from, you know, nothing to where we are now, at the same time we've all been in the, you know, crappy little minibus round China together and there's a sort of massive camaraderie amongst mm. us all and we're all very very supportive and and it's all very different I think we all feel that it's okay to support each other's yeah, collections absolutely. and enjoy them uh, you know individually and you know there just is a lovely atmosphere at the London mm. I don't go I go to Paris um, but I don't go to Milan but you just don't get the sense that there's the same level of camaraderie Mm -hmm. Amongst the designers there, I think you know the the press obviously all know each other and travel mm -hmm. in packs. And but um, I think it's it just is lovely to see all of my friends, yeah. you know, growing their businesses and receiving all sorts of international attention and getting you know many of them the, the plaudits they deserve because mm -hmm. you know we put these shows on again. I think the great difference between London and everywhere else is the you know that we managed to put shows on for for nothing. You know, yeah. half mm -hmm. of these shows, you know, you, we will look at pictures here of shows that have been put on for like. 4,000 quid and mm. less, you know, mm. and that's the amazing thing for me about all of this. It's, you know, the, the, the imagination, the creativity obviously mm. is free, mm. but, you know, people are putting on stuff that looks amazing and looks as good as some of the million pounds. Yeah, shows. absolutely. It's interesting you talk about that kind of international buyers thing, because actually there was something you wrote, Alex, which really intrigued me over the course of the London Collections Men, and it's a discussion you and I had, which was a show that a lot of people talked about, which was the Peter show, which is a really mm. young designer, and he shows um, off schedule and did a presentation. And you made the point that it's something that everyone's really excited about and makes a point that's got really good ideas, but doesn't have any stockists. And mm. I think that's an interesting with London, because it's kind of, you know, it's a blessing and a curse that London gets so much media attention, because that means that we see it as something that's really successful and growing and growing. But it has to be followed through with orders. And what are we going to do to attract the kind of, make sure people are putting their money where their mouth is? I don't think you can make, you know, you, you can't make people buy it. Uh, I think maybe sometimes it's a slight, I, as a menswear consumer, and I've spoken with other men who are also menswear consumers, sometimes feel a frustration that you see something on a catwalk that's amazing. And then when you go and look in the shop, yeah. It's, it's, you know, no buyers have bought it. Mm -hmm. You know, the one thing that you wanted is the one thing that doesn't have kind of a, a, an actual reality to it. It's not just consumers it. that find that frustrating, designers find that very frustrating because yeah. their message gets completely kind of 
twisted. But I think as well, you know, it's, it's very difficult for a designer to kind of, you know, Patrick has his own retail space. I remember us talking when, when you first talked about, or when you were first opening the eTort space and how you could have a buy that reflects what you want eTorts mm. to kind of represent in the mind of customers and, yeah. and the idea of attracting customers that maybe want those pieces that won't be bought by other retailers. Yeah. Mm. So I, th I think, you know, what I wouldn't like to see is London designers really trying to dumb down their message to make it into something that's very easily kind of digested by retailers because you know it's fine it is fine for a million pound business to do that for you know a really massive designer to have a commercial offshoot yeah so they don't have to sell the show but I really think kind of the strength of uh, the strength of the really great designers in London is is the kind of unique proposition we don't want to buy another t-shirt from them we don't want to buy another white shirt and if it is a white shirt it'd better be an amazing but white then that's shirt. my kind of question because you say you know we can't make people buy but what's the answer then because we're saying we don't want people to dumb down those ideas of course we don't but if people aren't buying what's the solution because otherwise people will end up having to drop off the schedule but i don't the thing is i i think it's a gradual process i think you do see more exciting designers being bought now i think there is this thrust in menswear where it's not just a, you know whenever I go to menswear my friends who aren't in fashion say oh how can you write about boring grey suits mm. for three weeks and I'm not writing about boring grey suits and I feel increasingly customers <laughs> are demanding you look great Patrick <laughs> Your grey suits aren't boring. No, they're fine. No, grey suits are. Well, every time I slag yeah. off a suit, you're wearing whatever suit I'm slagging <laughs> off. Last time it was a navy and suit, and you're wearing you say that. things to me like, you know what? I'm really loving wearing this suit. I bought this suit, and I love it, and I love the suit. Yeah, suit trousers. Um, <laughs> but and I think it's, I, I think increasingly now, you know, menswear, bar, menswear consumers are demanding more, are demanding that choice. Yeah. They don't want to buy into you know the commercial version people men are becoming more adventurous it's now much uh, you know a much larger proportion of of world sales i think it is now 50 50 mm. um but split between men's and women's there wear. was a while like about a year and a half ago where the men's luxury market was out, out selling the women's. it still is, is it's it? the, the growth in the men's luxury market is is exceeding the growth in the women's luxury market i don't think it outsells in terms of I, I don't Actual think the physical product. sales, but the, the growth potential. Mm -hmm. uh, it, it's growing at a much faster rate than women's. I think last year it was something like 12 or 15%. Mm. Um, and that's increasing. And that's not just, you, you know, obviously sales in China are uh, having a big impact, but it's not just in China. Mm. It, you know, it is across the board. I think men are demanding more from, from designers, men are de and men are demanding more from retailers as well. Mm. So. I think there is that sense that it will be a gradual process of retailers buying more exciting garments, seeing if they sell, and then investing. You know, I think you increasingly see that. You can see retailers investing in younger designers, we retailers. Saw that. A really good example of that is matchesfashion.com, which bought Craig, Craig Green really early on, which I think a lot of people found an odd choice for them in some mm. ways, and then it sold incredibly, incredibly well, which mm. I think is really really telling that if you do invest, that there is that market for it. But I think, I, also, I think it's it's... You know, it is testing the waters, it's seeing. Obviously, there are different types of consumers that gravitate towards different retailers. Yeah. So it's it's not being afraid to kind of, I guess it's not being afraid to make mistakes, it's not being afraid to buy things, to test mm. the waters, to see. But in, in an odd way, I think that when we think about London Fashion Week, that started 26 years ago, I think. I think it was 25 years last year or the year before. I'm not going to test my knowledge. Um, <laughs> I think it's 26 now. I think it's 20. And I think, um, you, you know, and London Collections Men's has been going for like three years. Mm. So that's th that's mm. quite a comparison to make. Um, you know, there's, there's a lot still to be done. Yeah. But I, I, the, the trouble with asking things like what can we do is there isn't a quick fix yeah. answer. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's the biggest question that everybody that's designing clothes faces because I think we all understand that actually the vast majority of the market is just buying straightforward clothes. Mm. I yeah. mean, they are buying, you know, men might love to look at these clothes and be excited by the way they feel wearing them, mm. but then ultimately are they going to wear them in their normal lives? And the answer is for the great, the great many men, particularly those men with the money to afford what are expensive yeah, clothes, you know, if you look at the market for, for, for expensive clothes in London, the men that have the money to buy these clothes are quite normal guys living quite normal yeah. lives. And they are, 
not prepared. They might enjoy these things as bits of art and, and enjoy you know, going to stores and trying these things on, but they're not going to wear them. And this is the, the great problem that we all face. The market for that really beautiful, unique, you know, shape-changing, life-altering piece of clothing is a few people in a few cities around the world. And this is why you know, the, we're, we're lucky in a way because actually you, the, 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 the internationalization, we, you know, we, we all take it for granted that we're yeah. all exporting to 50 countries around the world, which is pretty amazing when you consider it. Um, you know, we all, we're all selling in, you know, in China and Japan and Hong Kong mm -hmm. and and Korea and Vietnam and all over the place, which is astonishing really mm -hmm. considering you know, we're businesses that are you know, three years out of college. Yeah. <laughs> but it's little bits, you know, it's small orders mm -hmm. in yeah. uh, you know, like quite a large number of stores. And though the number of stores are increasing, but it's mm -hmm. still quite tricky. Whereas you know, the real business is in, you, know, you sell to Saks, you sell to 80 doors, you, mm -hmm. you, know, you get a million pounds a year worth of orders. Mm -hmm. You sell to Joyce and Dover Street and Colette and so and so. You you know you might be lucky to get a hundred thousand pounds worth of yeah. orders, and that is you know that is that is the reality of it. You mm. know what what is the really tricky bit is is you know you want to 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 show a, a sort of consistent creative you know vision for your your line, and some people do it incredibly well. Craig Green is a really interesting example because right from the word go everybody yeah. understands exactly what it's all about and mm. he's been really consistent and he is picking up lots and lots of stockists but is he going to sell you know a hundred million pounds a year of that and yeah. make a big business it's you know it's it's how does how do we all take you know how do you go from from this to something that's bigger and I think when Gareth mm. opened his store in Gareth Pugh opened his store in Hong Kong mm. you went in and it was just a beautifully you know curated set of black t-shirts white t-shirts mm. really simple basics um, but it's that is the real you know that's the nub of it we've got to mm. sell this stuff to make money we can't just be you know putting clothes out for fun mm. um, an ideas factory you yeah. know it, and, and that sometimes is what it seems like and mm. um, you know especially as the, you know there are more and more of us and now you know we have there are a dozen incredibly talented young designers all showing on the on the on the schedule at, at London and the more of them there are almost the more difficult it is for them all to make a living make because a living. the star the stores can't buy all of them there is mm. just so much you know there's only that much space in Dover Street and mm. Mm. Um, so it is it's tough and you know you do wonder how you make the leap from being that brilliant you know universally loved brand to something that that sells a lot and you can make you can actually make a living out of it and mm. we've seen a few people drop off in the last you know we had Medium Kirchhoff mm. have taken a break. I don't know quite where they're at. You know, Lou, uh, um, Louise Gray had to stop mm -hmm. for a couple of seasons. Mm -hmm. There's people with enormous talent yeah. that, you know, it's, 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 there has to be something commercial mm. in it. And they, you know, they, there aren't enough jobs in big houses. You know, you can see Craig going somewhere great yeah. and doing that and, and that working for him. But it's like, there isn't, there just, it's a constant battle, mm. you, you know. And, and there is no obvious answer. <laughs> <laughs> it's sad. <laughs> well, it's, well, it's not. I mean, it's, it's, no, it's, I know. It's, it's, it's less sad than, than it was a few years ago. It's like much less know. sad because yeah. the world is, you know, as you say, there are great, you know, there are lots mm. more places that we can all sell. And, and the, more the, the more internationally people love, you know, Craig mm. Green, the more he will sell. People yeah. will just want, you know, you just want to own it. I mean, it's amazing. And that's horrible. You know, that's it. I mean, I always think there is, as the flip side, as the negative flip side, there's that horrible thing of, you know, we look at amazing modern architecture and then you bear in mind the fact that the vast majority of, probably the vast majority of British people live in, you know, Barrett homes mm. built in kind of mock Tudor style. <laughs> <laughs> so there is that kind of, you know, or a large number of people live in that. So there is, you know, there is that sense of, you know, it, it, it is what what we see as kind of fashion journalists, what we see in high fashion, it's it's a niche. It's mm. a niche. It's never going to appeal yeah. across the board. Um, but my the the point I made in the article that you referenced mm. was the fact that you know I do people really buy ideas, and I would I would hope that people are, at this level, I feel like people's horizons are being broadened. It's something we've seen in women's wear. Yeah. That people are you know buy more adventurous clothes. Pe I think people who are buying high fashion just have more money mm. and more money to buy more clothes and to buy you know clothes that make a real statement. Mm. Um, and I think that's it, it's become the case in women's wear. And I think 
increasingly you're kind of seeing it become the case in men's I world. think it's if, I think it's fundamentally different. I think women with a lot of money are prepared to wear much more adventurous clothes in their sort of ordinary lives. Mm. And I think, you know, if you look at the, the vast majority of, you know, in London, London's a bit different, and there are more adventurous clothing cities than, than London. Okay. Yeah. Um, but the men, you know, if you, if, to make a living selling, you know, you need to be people, you need to have people that are spending thousands and thousands of pounds a year buying your stuff. Mm. You need, re you know, you need a, 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 a sort of coterie of regular clients who come every season and will spend two, three, four thousand pounds on your stuff. Lawyers and they're bankers and lawyers, mm. and you know, banking and lawying women will happily wear much more interesting yeah. pieces yeah. of clothing yeah. in their daily lives than the blokes will. Mm. Mm. What's your take, Steve? You're staying very quiet. <laughs> it's, it's, I mean, it's you just wish you were a banker so you could wear crepe green. And yeah, just to, just to kind of break the norm. It's yeah. quite depressing. I wish, yeah. I wish that they, we could kind of, you know, it's our job, I guess, to kind of persuade them almost to, yeah. to kind of see this side. Um, yeah. Break, I think know, that's free. what Craig is doing. It's interesting because you're wearing Craig, and I think that's what's really interesting about what he does. And it's people still look at me in a very odd way when I'm, when I'm mm. swooshing about. Like I've got, I've got the the, the black uh, kind of almost cape shirt as well. Yeah. Uh, this is a little bit more kind of I can get away with it in like everyday tube wear. But if I'm wearing that kind of like the cape just by itself, they're <laughs> watching me. Yeah. <laughs> they're like looking at me in quite an odd way. And it's yeah. like for me, it's, it is just kind of a you know slightly deconstructed shirt. It's nothing yeah. too. It's nothing too out there, but. For some people, it's still still too much. Yeah. Um, yeah, it's interesting, isn't it? Because I think you know, Craig. It's a narrative of his. You know, that he's really good at making ordinary clothes that what blokes actually want to wear. But then it's interesting that you say it because I think that's kind of fashion bubble talking, perhaps, isn't it? It's an interesting one. Is what we consider normal, um, as opposed to what other people consider. But the normal. good thing about this season, there was nothing on the on the front pages of the of the tabloids and the Daily Mail that was kind of like lambasting it, going, mm. "What is this kind of idiot like London menswear?" Which is yeah. great, and I think. But they've still never. For me, they didn't. Nobody lost anything. Sibling still did make the uh, yeah, of it. Yeah. The Daily Mail, and I think they just they? They, they take it as their duty to put one thing. something of sibling. Yeah. I don't think sibling on. were trying to be quiet and retiring this <laughs> season. There, I think, was it I think Lisa Lisa loves it when they get yeah. the Daily Mail. Like Harry Potter designed by Liberace. That's why I like Lisa. <laughs> yeah. Lisa. Yeah, that's quite nice. <laughs> it was super fun. But yeah, I don't, but there were there weren't any quite like, some kind of like headline grabbing moments this yeah. season. But for me, nobody lost anything either. Mm. I think there was a real kind of cement, like the designers cementing their kind of um, their point of view. I think this season. Yeah. I was, wanted to ask Patrick whether that was something that the BFC are kind of asking, or was that just kind of a, a natural evolution where, where the designers that have been around for a few seasons now realise what they need to do to kind of focus their. Well, I think this is it. I think you all, you know, the the the, the BFC have done a fantastic job, and you know, Man and you know, Fashion East mm. and Top Man have done a phenomenal job of creating a support structure that allows you to get from, from inception mm. to what? If you follow it all the way through to the end of Fashion 4, you, you, you know, you've got, what, six, eight seasons yeah. or something mm. maybe to, mm. to get it right. But you, you see that end line and you think, right, by that point, I've, you know, I've got to be, it has, has to be a business, business yeah, at this point. Business, yeah. And it can't just be, and I think a lot of people are now looking forward with certain amount of nervousness to that point, I think you know. I think um, some, you know, I think watching buyers, we, we're all in the same showroom. Yeah. You know, we 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 you start to see what people, are, you know, you, we watch each other's appointments. And like yeah. you know, that, you know, it's you start. Intimate, to, it is yeah. very intimate. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You start to see, and you you're starting to think, well, what is my thing? What do you know? What do people want from us? What you know? What um, ultimately, also, what? How are we going to? make that leap from small sales to larger sales and without you know compromising you know what we feel is important about what we do um, and there, there are a lot of a lot of the the the, the designers that have been through um, um, uh, new gen mm. and and fashion forward are getting to the end of that support period and it's mm. just I think it starts to starts to focus the mind on you know, on, on commerce a little bit, which, yeah. you know, I think what is lovely is that you get the chance to create uh, a sense of yourself without really too much need for the sort of mm. dirty commerce to kick in. Mm. But then you get to a point where reality is, you're gonna have to, you know, the free studios end, the, you know, mm. the, the grants stop, you know, the support for the showroom space ends, and you're like, you know, this is now gonna cost me something every season and I've gotta, got to earn it and it can't you know we're lucky that there's a certain amount of other stuff that we do that you know 
collaborations with mm. Top Man or Debenhams or whoever mm. it might be that helps us support it. But you, you can't just live on that forever. Mm. You, ha you, you come to a point where you start thinking, I have to know my guy and I have to start selling the thing. And it, it's almost, it's, you know, I was talking to, um, I, I can't even remember who it was, a musician about this. Uh, I, was, I was talking to Ben Hudson about this, mm. talking about how, how it feels to be a musician where you have a fan base who loves what you're doing and you're a person who's constantly striving for newness. Mm -hmm. It's like it is that, that tension exists the entire time between yeah. doing what you know people love you for and want to continue consuming and having new ideas that you want to push. Yeah. And yeah. that, you know, we're all, in, we're all in that little kind of world a little bit. Yeah. Mm. yeah, it's interesting, isn't it? But the idea, I think, of like consolidating your guy and who you're, who you're sort of catering to, it's interesting that you say you felt that people had done that this season. Did you agree with that, Alex? Yeah, no, yeah. absolutely. I think it was very much about, and in a sense, there wasn't that jolt that sometimes you feel when someone's doing something exceptional and something that you haven't seen before. It, was, it felt like it was more a, you know, a refinement of ideas. For instance, you know, I, I loved Christopher Shannon, but Christopher Shannon very much felt like it was refining ideas yeah. that he's been exploring. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Certainly for the, you know, in depth, I would say for the last three seasons. Yeah. Um, and with Craig again, it felt like it was refining kind of his signatures. Yeah. Um, Do you think the I weaker think collections are the ones where people weren't quite sure what they were about? I think that I think the weaker designers are the designers that don't know quite what they're about. Mm -hmm. And I think it, it, perhaps with, with people that were refining their signatures I became aware of designers where you were like well, what actually is their signature I can't really pinpoint what what they represent who, who I can't really pinpoint where they I mean there's you know there are a few different ones um, I I got a bit lost looking at James Long like I didn't really know what he wanted and, and after having um, a few seasons that, that were strong mm -hmm. I think last season he went in an odd direction and this season he went in an odd direction um, Personally, I felt Aggie and Sam have been kind of wavering a little bit over the last couple of seasons. And it's, it, you know, p and people are allowed to waver. You can have weak seasons. Yeah. But I think when everyone else seems to be consolidating what they're doing, really, I keep saying consolidating and refining, but really that's, that's what it felt like a lot of it was about this season. Yeah. Um, and really kind of pulling into what they're what is their strong point mm. when someone else is playing to their strengths it only emphasizes other people's weaknesses yeah. i yeah. feel yeah you know I, I felt you know with 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 what you did as well patrick it was very much after last season which was exploring kind of casual wear mm. and this was very much a, a pullback yeah. for me to things like oh well you're going to come to torts for a really great big coat and mm. a really great big suit like mm. you know really very much about this is this is what we do incredibly well and mm. you know and we we can deal with you know and there was such a kind of britishness to it mm. there always is but this yeah. Yeah. Maybe it's because I'm from the north, and it was kind of <laughs> it was very road it to Wigan Pier yeah. when yeah. I was it looking. Was very road, to, very Wigan road Pier. to Wigan Pier, yeah. and from <laughs> just near Wigan. Kind of took so it away. you know, uh, but that idea, I, and I think when people are really again I guess being like well this is what we're about and if you're buying into us mm. this is what you're buying into well, we had this conversation when you came into the store I mean that we've we've had a store for three months now mm. well just three and a half months and it's a beautiful store congratulations you. Um, but you you it, it really sharpens the mind you know mm. we have sold sort of 80% of our sales have come from about 20% of our products yeah and you really start to you know you you know, our guy is an older guy. He's a he, luckily he's a guy with money, mm. but he has a certain sensibility, and he has you know he has a way of dressing that you know we 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 know who he is. We've seen him in mm. real life, and the guys who run my shop give me every day. You know, this person has come in. He did this. This is his mm. job. This is his life. This is his you know this is his taste. He tried on these things, mm. and you know it really really starts to focus your attention on mm. on who it is that enjoys what you do and that's what ultimately you know it, it, it's a lovely feeling to have people buying and wearing the clothes and you start to think about I think as well they come to you about. specifically I think that's the, another yeah, important thing yeah, and course. it's actually kind of as a case study it's quite unique in in London fashion in terms of designers that are at the level that that talks is at and w which I would equate to a lot of the other designers we've been talking about mm. is the fact that you have a retail space that's devoted to your brand and that's devoted to pe you know and that people kind of make a pilgrimage to go so you know they're not it's it's not comprised of 
passing trade of people mm. in a department store yeah. that maybe see what you've done and maybe think about trying it on. It's people that are very, spe- you know, very specifically want to come and yeah. buy things mm. from talks and are drawn, you know, are drawn to what you're doing. Yeah. And I think many, I mean, maybe the answer for some of the others is that, you know, there needs to be a way that actually they can present their, you know, present their clothes to the public in the same way yeah. that each season they present their clothes to the press yeah. and the buyers. <laughs> yeah. Um, you know, it would be lovely that, you know, that all of these guys, I mean, it, it really, you know, A, you make more money if you mm. have your own store yep, rather yep. than wholesaling it. You make a good chunk more. Mm. Um, and, you know, we've talked, I was, who was I talking to who had who'd done a little pop-up and had, uh, it was, um, oh gosh, uh, Kit Neal had done yeah. a pop-up and he mm. said it was great because he was in there and he was just yeah. seeing people coming in and seeing yeah. the way, it, you know, the public were actually responding mm. his, to his stuff and buying it and he was making money and yeah. Yeah. smiling all the way to the bank you know and um, you know it used to be it used to be different I think the way you know Paul Smith started his business with a little shop in Nottingham and he learned you know Everything, he learned his yeah. business as a and he still keeper. goes which is yeah. yeah I've been in on at six o'clock on a Sunday evening and he was there which really freaked me out <laughs> 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 but sorry but yeah, I was just sort of like oh my god yeah. like, but people started off you know in, in uh, as a brand with a shop yeah. and you know and grew themselves from that yeah. we all start off because the opportunity is there as designers with catwalk yeah. shows and wholesale collections. And often straight out of art college, mm, which yeah. I think is really, it's interesting to talk about that and just have a look at the man show yeah. because I think that's a really good example of it. And, and it's interesting we're seeing because of tuition fees, you know, even more that people who are showing as part of Fashion East or you know, man or, or what have you now coming straight from BA, not even MA. So it's mm. really interesting. There's all this notion of, you know, knowing about a consumer and talking to your shopper. It's just so removed from kind of their experience. Yeah. What did we think of Man this season? Steve, did you like it? I did. I missed it, actually. I was at the office. So I, it was a show that Lucky. I missed. But um, each of the designers I am kind of friends with, so I'm, I'm, I'm quite familiar with their aesthetics. <laughs> I mean, Rory was, Rory was, a, was, was, was a relatively newcomer to yeah. my mind. But, um, I mean, there was, a, there was quite a lot of criticism towards it. And I can see, really? I can see, yeah. There was a, there was a cra- the, cra- cra- the Craig Green kind of... Uh, and then also the uh, sort of Nick Amido and J.W. Anderson kind yeah. of familiar. You oh, can see. see their influences okay. a little bit more. Uh, mm. For me, it's a bit more, it's a bit more naive than uh, than it could be. Yeah. Um, I really I enjoyed it. it. I, I actually thought Rory's show. collection was lovely, and I yeah. think yeah. there's it's very there's, well made. Yeah, it's it's mm. it's it's beautiful. It, I think yeah. the way it drapes is lovely. Yeah. I think the shapes mm. are really beautiful. I think the delicacy of the fabric is, mm. I think it's just really nicely pitched. Um, mm. Liam Hodges, I really like. I think mm. personally, he's yeah. a great, he's a very interesting character. He's and so I think nice. he's, 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 and he has a, I wasn't sure, I didn't love the orange, <laughs> but I, I do like everything he does. And I think mm. it's, um, he comes out, he, you know, there is a new, unique sense of who mm. he is in his clothes, which you know, he's, he's, he and I think he does right. think a lot. It's interesting, actually, that I just kind of contradicts the point I made before, but that's what this is about. <laughs> <laughs> Which is, I get the sense with Liam, actually, that he cares incredibly deeply about the clothes that men wear and the clothes that men around him wear and normal blokes wear. You yeah. get the sense that that's really in his consciousness in a way yeah. that perhaps the two other designers don't think about as much. I thought it was really interesting um, with Nick and Reed's collection, the the reference points and it got me a lot thinking about the way we think about the history of menswear and this idea of of menswear tradition and menswear heritage and it made me think about how we think of that as a very kind of we often relate that to Savile Row or I guess even the way that kind of like white middle class men dress and the history of their clothes rather than the history of other cultures Mm. which is equally as valid if you think about what the UK is like which I thought was really interesting because he really drew on kind of Muslim dress and where he grew up in Hounslow and I thought that was really interesting just made me think a lot about when we refer to sort of tradition in menswear, how narrow that can be sometimes. What did you think about it, Alex? You're looking very non No, I'm just now wondering. <laughs> oh, we just don't agree with what I'm saying. I'm just now wondering, having talked about that, and I'm not a particularly politically correct person, but he doesn't have a single non-white model, so. Yeah, Which, I think you know. Anyway, and I thought his collection looked like J.W. Like Anderson mixed with problem, Simone Roche for J. Brand, so. I wasn't a particular a fan. fan of it. Did you think the whole the whole of the Man Show was too? No, I, d- I don't think you can. It's not because the Man Show isn't. It is a single show, but it's not a single show. I don't yeah. think you can dismiss the whole of the Man Show no. as you know. Well, this is what it was like because it it, it wasn't. You know, it, it's it's three designers 
they are distinct designers. Mm -hmm. I felt like they put um, Liam in the middle because he was, maybe the two aren't quite as distinct as they should be. Yeah. Um, you know, it's, it's Rory's first show and it, there were references to his MA collection, yeah. graduating mm -hmm. from St. Martin's. Um, the, it was incredibly well made. It was incredibly well made. That was actually yeah. the thing that, that stood out to me. And in a way me. brilliant, because you know, if you don't get that right, which is a problem for so well, many no, other it's, designers. When you were like, looking, it's, you know, it's a really beautifully made black jacket that I could see, uh, you know, has a, a viability. I've actually stand written... Stand up against side of the Well, I've page, written yeah. about things having a viability. If they're really beautifully made, they don't perhaps have to be the most original thing, because yeah. the fact they're really beautifully made out of really great cloth. Mm. Um, it is, is very seductive mm. um, but in the same way that when you go to the MA collection you know it used to be you know it used to be echoes of Galliano then it was echoes yeah. of McQueen then yeah. you go and there's you know yeah. there are echoes, echoes of, Kim, of maybe. exactly yeah. echoes of Kim echoes yeah. of Christopher Kane echoes of uh, yeah. you know e echoes of Craig Green recently mm. you know that they're very young designers and I think judging them I know we give them a fantastic platform for, for the kind of publicity that we would give to a brand like Prada but I think judging them alongside a brand like Prada at this point in their yeah. career is sort of fundamentally wrong. But I don't think that's what yeah. people are doing. I and for me to say that as the yeah. horrible snarky bitch that I am <laughs> is you know it's actually something that I was talking with 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 Susie Bubble about yeah. and, uh, at an MA show and yeah. saying it wasn't good enough and Susie said it's an MA show. Yeah. But I think it's hard, isn't yeah. it? Because it's like you want, obviously, you can't put it alongside Prada, even though it is put alongside Prada. But then, and I think there's still, of course, you have to look for whether there's valid ideas or not. Yeah. I think, for, in a way, it's hard, isn't it? Because a part of me goes, you know, forgive if it's not as well made as it should be, but judge it on the ideas. But maybe it's the reverse. Maybe you should judge if, it, if it's well made and, and forgive on the ideas being a bit naive. It's, yeah. it's a really hard one to I judge. Think, I think as, a, as, as somebody who's on the other end of, you know, the, the, the receiving end of, 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 of Criticism, and I mean that in Alex a very Fury. open way. Um, <laughs> no, no, no. But um, what it, you know, I actually, you do get the sense that on the whole, journalists do appreciate that we are starting. You know, our resources are you know five yeah. quid and a tiny room in the back of God knows where, mm. and um, that. You know, in the same way that music journalists will go and see a new band in a scuzzy location mm. and just hear something that just gives them a sense yeah. that this person will get to, yeah. you know, yeah. to be something interesting. I think in the same way, we, I think on the whole, you know, the London fashion press do appreciate that, you know, you can't be the fully formed article. And actually yeah. what's interesting about all of this, as opposed to what bands do in back you know small mm. you know, rooms above pubs and whatever this is very very public so you exactly, have to yeah. do all of your mm. you experimentation mistake, yeah. growing yeah. mistake making it yeah. all gets done very publicly and actually you know it would be better if we all kind of apart from a few exceptions who do are straight out the blocks mm. instantly have it yeah. um, but you know you you it it, it is difficult because you do have to you know, you do have, you, you were always going on a, a journey of trying things and trying to integrate and also you're learning as you go along. You start off knowing a bit and then you add things and you try to pull things into the collection with bits that you've mm, learned yeah. how to do. Like all of a sudden you start mm. working with, you know, some new print technique or some mm. new weaving technique or, and you bung it in the show and you think, oh, cr you think six months later, I really, you know, I wish that, that had just been done yeah. behind closed doors. <laughs> But it's but it isn't. It's out there, and yeah, everyone can yeah. see it. But but you know, that's also kind of the fun because mm. you know you're allowed to fall o over and kind of make a fool of yourself occasionally in public. And and as long as you sort of learn and use mm. the bits that work and discard the bits that don't, then I think you you get there. You 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 just can't be the mm. fully formed article right but from I the think, beginning. I think everybody yeah. has to accept that. But that's you know, also the whole point of of things like man is to yeah. let you go through those growing pains, yeah. which, which maybe it would be better if they weren't public. But actually doing it publicly and getting that feedback is part of. And sometimes that. the yeah. mistakes can be beautiful and yeah. really important. But as well, what, you know, you see, I, I think you know a lot of designers have gone through that, and it makes them much better designers because yeah. they they have that time to experiment. You know, when mm. I know it's it's women's wear, but having spoken with with Simone Roche, she said, kind of leaving Fashion East was the impetus for her to really think, well. You know, I'm on my own. What What do I want to do now? And mm. she was like, you know, fashionists let her kind of play and experiment, mm. and and in a sense, she were cosseted a little bit. Yeah. Which mm. is, I think, the same with man because it is 
Lulu Kennedy, fashion godmother, and she does she looks after people, and it's this very gentle introduction to the fashion industry, yeah. mm. which I think is why, particularly when uh, you know we have MA students here, but particularly in future when we're, it's probably going to be dominated with BA students. Mm. Um, I think it's an incredibly important step for people to take because you're not out in, you know, you're still in the nest a little bit, yeah, you're not yeah. out in the big bad world having to fend for yourself, you are supported, you are cosseted, mm. um, you know, y y you're cradled a little bit, which mm. is incredibly important, I think. Well, I was quite pleased that Grace Wales Bonnet was in the installations rather yeah. than being fast tracked maybe to, to man, which could have been the case yeah. for, this, for this season. But, um, yeah, let's talk about Grace because everyone went, was sort that of obsessed was, For me that felt like old. Uh, when I started kind of getting into London menswear because it, it was kind of a free-for-all in there. It was a very small <laughs> venue. That was, I'd yeah. never been there before. It was kind of, yeah, Ludo Kennedy had found this small space yeah. and there was a kind of magnetism towards Grace Wells. I mean, the other designers within that are doing some amazing work as well, but mm. she kind of stole everything, stole people's attention mm. uh, and the headlines as well, um, just because what she's doing is so articulated. Yeah. Um, what did you... What what about it do you think appealed? Just its celebration of who, what she was doing really, in terms of like this yeah. kind of, cele sort of delving into this duality that interests her. Yeah. Kind of, um, and the kind of the celebration of the black, the black man as well, which yeah. is which refreshing. We don't see that in any other city. No. In, on the kind of um, schedule. Yeah, it's interesting. I think you're right with that point of view thing. It just felt like she had a real kind of, um, it just felt incredibly authentic. Yeah. Which I think is sometimes something that is missed from the work of young designers because obviously they, they're you know, coming out of St Martin's or LCF looking at, the, looking at the books in the libraries, referencing things and perhaps it doesn't feel like it's about them as much. Whereas this really, really, really did. Did you yeah. go to Fashion East, Alex? No, I didn't. Did you not? No. That's a shame. I was working. <laughs> <laughs> I was Talk, doing a newspaper. Fair enough. Uh, talking a little bit about, um, I think it's interesting what you said about the white models uh, thing at MAN because I think one of the things, a designer who kind of really always pushes you know, tirelessly pushes racial diversity on the runway, but also just in his designs, like drawing on um, different cultures and different ethnicities and the way different people dress is Nazir, which is really interesting. And um, did you go to the show, Steve? Yes. Yeah, what did you think and of And I did the of panel Nazir? too. I was quite, I mean, Ag Aggie and Sam and Nazir were the two ones that surprised me. Aggie and Sam, because they'd been kind of delving in this, into this kind of sleekness that didn't feel right for them. In my yeah. mind, I loved it and I actually bought, I bought quite a few of the pieces, but didn't necessarily feel like Aggie and Sam. Yeah. This season they went back to kind of being a bit more kind of chaotic. dejection of fun and, yeah. and chaos, which is I, which I see from, from those two. Uh, and Nazir surprised me just because, for me, he pushed it on much further than I expected him to. Yeah. Um, and was trying things that he's never tried before. Yeah. Um, before he's kind of been kind of slightly tweaking his archetypes. Yeah. Whereas this is, yeah, same same boys, same guys, but um, yeah. Slightly, slightly new ideas and, and kind of mm. playing with, with the branding of Nazir. That was yeah. the thing that surprised me because, you know, we've, we've all seen, it's probably the most recognised logo London, of London, London yeah. it's everywhere. Yeah. Um, and even at the show, I think you were, I think you came into the show, Patrick, were you there? Nazir, no, I didn't no? see it, no. But um, just, just before it started, like this group of Nazir girls came in and yeah. it was kind of like, everyone was like, oh, I don't know. Yeah. Yeah. Your criticism is a bit in the past, Alex, it's interesting what Steve says, because you said that you feel like there's not enough fresh ideas each season. Um, so I said that specifically about last season. Yeah, I felt there weren't enough fresh ideas this season. I, I thought this season was very different. I, I thought this, this season, season had a lot more. <laughs> but I was at, I was at the Mojella show, yeah. which I actually thought yeah. it was qu it was quite unfortunate that. Mm. Yeah, it was real I mean, shame. There's, there's not, there weren't a great number of people that had to kind of split their allegiances between men's and women's wear. No. Um, but unfortunately, I was I was one of those people, and I yeah. did have to go to to see the Mojella show, and, and I think missed two or three yeah. shows because of it. Yeah, I mean, I think Nazir is somebody who really has nailed that sort of identity thing, and people mm. there is a there is a really strong following. Again, we see again when you, we're in the showroom in Paris, you see troops of buyers, and it's one of those brands mm -hmm. that is really, really well worn by yeah. by people. And I think you know he is a designer who has you know has an identity that's incredibly strong, and you know to the extent that. You know the Victoria's Secret show. Um, yeah. You know, Sophia yeah. had a, a, a Nazir section, yeah. and it yeah. was like, and it was very obviously him. And that, yeah. Yeah. you know, you you just you felt so happy for him because yeah. that's, I mean, that's a huge yeah. moment for somebody. Yeah. And and there were lots of other London designers 
in that show, Kirkwood's mm. Shoes were in there, Antonio yeah. Berardi was in there, but you didn't know it was them, it was all just consumed within mm. Victoria's Secret. But then there was Nazir's a kind of Nazir yes. section Take in over, the Victoria's yeah. Secret show, which yeah. has been to, what, 180 million, yeah. whatever, 500, I mean, it's the most, yeah. 500, 500 million. 500, okay, I mean, it's just, Terrifying. you know, you just, so hope, much about you just hope to goodness <laughs> that he's got enough stock in the, yeah. you know, in the world, because, yeah. and you hope that he, you know, you really just, you're hoping that actually that's a moment that just forces his business into mm -hmm. you know a sort of reality because it it really could it's quite a well formed I mean it, it's not my thing at all you know I, it's no. not something I, yeah <laughs> you know but you know it's it's brilliantly well done and, and I think he you know he has an opportunity of of, of you know amongst all of you know the the um, the sportswear brands I think his is the one that has the clearest identity and probably has the best chance. Well, I remember him saying to me at, at one point, or saying, I think it was a panel that I was on, that, that really he wanted to sell it at JD Sports. And the very interesting thing for me is when I look at it, I see it in that sort of, uh, in the way that people have allegiances to Adidas yeah, and, and to, yeah. I'm, I'm probably mispronouncing this sportswear name because I don't know, <laughs> you know, Adidas and Nike and Puma yes. and, <laughs> Now. You should um, know, you write about men, you write about fashion, how can you not know about sports? I like his pronunciation, it works. It's fine, that's how it's spelled. Um, <laughs> but you know, the, the way that the, the, the allegiances people build up where they would yeah. never dream yeah. of wearing something yeah. else. Yeah. Yeah. I think Nizir kind of has that yeah. as well, and oh, that's yeah. that's very very interesting. It's, it's quite blokey as well, yeah. you know. But it's so interesting going back to what we said right at the start, which is like we really kind of had this narrative that you know what we see here isn't for ordinary people. It's not for your man on the street. Whereas I think what is so impressive about this and really refreshing and and it frustrates when people kind of talk about it like oh you know the Nazir tribe the streetwear camp because I think look at this and this is more relevant than than so much else of what we see at fashion week because this is how a huge number of pe of men in the in the UK dress and not just in the UK in the world that's how they dress yeah. every yeah. day they wear tracksuits they wear this kind of stuff to work or on their yeah. weekends and I think it's so relevant. If I was the boss of Ardidas, I'd be, uh, <laughs> uh, I'd, I'd, yeah. I'd buy Nazir and, you know, and no. turn yeah. it into something really substantial yeah. because yeah. I think it has that possibility. Absolutely. Definitely. It's interesting, just because we're talking about this, to go and talk about Astrid Anderson because I think she's another person that's really, really clear about who her guy is. and. What I find tirelessly impressive about her is how she manages to be totally kind of on point each season for him. But I feel like she really develops and really pushes mm. things forward every single season. There's kind of a, a really distinct shape change or a silhouette change. And I find that really intelligent. I thought this was a really strong show. Would we, any of you guys there? Yeah, I was yeah. there. Yeah. I really like, I, you know, I really like what Astrid does because I think it's, you talk about like, you know, that cliche of luxury sportswear, but I love that her luxury sportswear is made out of, you know, silk duchess satin and <laughs> lace <laughs> and astrakhan. Yeah. There was a point about, which I said to her, there was a point about two or three seasons ago where it got so ridiculous that suddenly it made sense. It was like, <laughs> yeah. and, and actually she's showing um, a bespoke fur range as part, uh, for men as part, of London, as part of New York women's wear yeah. on yeah. next Thursday, week today, yeah. um, because it's a huge part of, of what she sells, yeah. it, you know, and she sells it to people in LA and in the Middle East, yeah. the two hottest places on the planet. Like, <laughs> which I, I find that quite, you know, I love the fact that, re and really, she's aware that we don't think that was kind of, you know, this ridiculous sort of indulgence on her behalf. And she's like, no, that that's what people yeah. want from me. That's yeah. and really, they yeah, do yeah, want yeah. it to be pushed further. And it's further. not a styling detail, which I think yeah. is the way, you know, when a lot of the young designers kind of put like a fur in there, it is kind of like to get. A little, like to get your look on a trend. But also, it's yeah. not it's not laziness. It's not yeah. that lazy luxury of oh, let's just make it out of fur and it's because such a part that of her makes heritage it interesting. as well. You know, fur yeah. is something yeah. that she yeah. grew up around, and yeah. I think yeah. that's. I know a lot of people have issues with it and have issues with men in fur as well. But but for her, it's it's a, a very viable. Do you think people have more issues with men in fur than women in fur? Yeah, because men in fur look way more ridiculous than women in fur. Oh, I don't think a so. man in a full length fur coat. Can look like an absolute. Thank you. The, only, the people that are buying it in terms of Astrid Anderson character um, customers. Can we put that quote on Twitter? As well? <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Oh, a man, I've, I've said this, and I think there's this thing of you know Sorry, a man in a fur coat line. either looks like Fred Flintstone or Liberace. Those are your two variations. <gasps> no, well, you can look like you know, very 60s difficult. John Lennon, like kind of sexy. But I think it's very difficult to hit in the middle. You I think. wear fur. Well, yeah, I wear fur, but I, I wouldn't wear a full <laughs> fur coat. Okay, good to know. I think I would. 
because that yeah, yeah you can a put big it on you yeah. can yeah. You know, I think but see I also think in a that, sort of Cossacky. <laughs> well certain sort men of, can yeah. pull it off like I couldn't pull it off you know from the back I'd look like John Rivers I'm not going <laughs> to wear a fur coat like that's what it comes down to but uh, you know I don't have moral issues with fur um, I know a lot of people do and I, I think actually um, in, in menswear ex- but I think as well it's exacerbated <laughs> in menswear by aesthetic issues with it as well that's interesting um, Sorry, Steve, what were you but saying? For me, um, every di- everyday guys aren't necessarily buying, aren't the ones buying the fur jackets. It is yeah. kind of like superstars of, of hip hop. Yeah. yeah. You know, and yeah. I think ASAP can pull it off, whereas maybe myself and Alex less so. Guys, Patrick can. I think you need some Queen's confidence. I think you'd look great. Chris Sunningby, darling of the. We could, could pull it off. We couldn't pull it off necessarily. No, I think no. you could. I think we need some confidence. We'll see. Issues. We'll see. I need to get some confidence issues on that. There's yeah. some people we haven't talked about. It's interesting when we're talking about Astrid because I know aesthetically they do seem very different to me from someone like Astrid to J.W. Anderson, but I think this something London always does tirelessly and very interestingly is a play on gender and a play on what's masculine and what's feminine and, and how those like those ideas can be clashed. And I think Astrid does it just as validly and just as intriguingly as J.W. Anderson does. Um, I think with him it's much more obvious because it is really his stick, you know, gender bending. Um, actually, it wasn't the gender fluidity in the show that I found the most interesting thing. It was kind of the treatment of time and the treatment of kind of the signatures of different decades and how they've mm. been mixed and clashed that I found most interesting. Um, what did you think of the show, Alex? Um, I, I really liked it. It wasn't, you know, it, it, again, I felt like it was a consolidating show. I know a lot of mm. people that had um, incredibly positive reactions to it. Um, but for me, it really felt like it, it was sort of refining what he stands for. Yeah. Um, the references, I always find it very interesting with with the kind of gender fluidity slash retail fluidity of J.W. Anderson when you see his women's wear pre-collection yeah. the week before and then you see his men's wear and there are direct reflections yeah. of garments yeah. in there. Um, Same garments. You know. <laughs> but no, and as, as you know, as a man that often wears women's wear, it's in, you know it's interesting. It just means that I can go down a whole variety of sizes in, into women's wear, you know. <laughs> but I think also that's it's, you know, we kind of laugh at it a little bit, but that so many people are doing that now. Like it's so much what it's mm. what I think men's wear collections are going to be. They are going to be men's slash women's pre collections, yeah. where it's you know when the the sort of manifesto that you had on the seats at Prada could have been a J W Anderson manifesto, Absolutely, which was yeah. gender is a context, it is meaningless, um, you know, and it wasn't about. I think a lot of people read it and were like, oh, how is that reflecting this collection? And I was like, no, it's that what this is 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 the ethos of what Michia Prada is going to be doing from now yeah. on. It's her saying, I'm going to be showing women's and men's together mm-hmm. every January and every June and you're going to have to deal with it. But it's really strange because I actually had a conversation at London Collections and with a group of people where I was like, I find it really, really bizarre that we expect uh, designers to split their ideas between men and women and that they got, don't, can't even show those ideas as like a group thing together without it being seen as a very commercial decision. And literally everyone like laughed me out of that horrible hotel that everyone was going to during London Collection and the Hoxton Hotel place. <laughs> and was like, that's ridiculous, blah, blah, blah. But I, I do find it really weird because I think you talk about it there like it's a commercial decision, but also I think aesthetically and just in terms of like creatively, how bizarre to, to, to expect designers to kind of like split a notion between but, a man but, and a woman. But, but I, I talk about it commercially because I think predominantly it is commercial decision. I don't know mm. if it is entirely commercial though. But, I don't but then why are men in the women's shows? That's the big question. They're putting women in the men's shows because it's offering publicity for pre-collections that otherwise they would have to shoot specific lookbooks for or stage specific shows. But do you not shows. think that's a timing thing in terms of, I, I think you know, designers are never given the forum to show in a gender neutral way. So you know, they're always going to respond to a way that's going to result in the most sales because it's a system that's been set up for them. I don't know what you mean. Like, isn't the the fashion schedule that we have exists? So they're always going to have to try and find the the best way to kind of fudge. But no, that. because you know, pra- la- you know, last winter Prada showed men's looks in the women's show. Mm. That's the you know the looks that well, it's, it's it's not it's a women's look that I bought. But you know, they showed mm. men men's looks that hadn't been shown at the men's mm. show in the women's show, mm. and that was a creative decision. Mm. Um, but I think increasingly, when people are putting women in the men's show, it, it's it's to give mm. publicity to those women's looks. But it's it's not. I don't think it's it's, it's predominantly a creative. I think they are, you know, they're conceived together and there is a, a creative link. But at the same time, I think you also look at the fact that this is a, these are lots of clothes that are all going to sit together mm. in a shop. And if you have mm. two completely, you know, mm. completely opposed ideas, sit, they will sit very uncomfortably together in a shop. Mm. 
Mm. Um, it's interesting because it's not something J.D. Anderson has ever done, is putting men in the women's and women's in the men, despite the fact that we will talk about him as, mm. as someone who plays with gender a lot. So it's an interesting one to think about. I also have to say the soundtrack at this was the best soundtrack of London Fashion Week, maybe of the whole season, because he had Michelle Gobert does his music yeah. and they had, it's like big, elegant, ugly fish or something, that's not what it's called, and it's in perfect list, and it's just a, a list of like awful things. It's like Margaret Thatcher, red sock <laughs> in the white wash. Mm. But one of them was like evil gossiping fashion bastard, which everyone seemed to miss, but I thought it was pretty good and just quite funny for a J-Dub show. <laughs> um, I want to move away a little bit from from kind of this side of London fashion and talk a little bit about what we saw kind of in the more sartorial side and, and on the road because it's really interesting time and we can go because we have Patrick here and um, but also there's a couple of things I want to talk about in terms of that because one thing you wrote Alex which I found interesting you talked about how London doesn't have a fashion identity almost that seemed to be the point you were trying to make you know we know what Milan's about we know what Paris is about and we don't perhaps know what London is because it's kind of polarized between these two things so there's one aspect that we should perhaps come to later, which is that, but also just in terms of the road, there was as much interesting, exciting things going on. One of them was Kilgore, which, did you get to go and see what Carlo's done there? I mean, I've seen it. What do you think? I've seen the photographs. I mean, it, it, to me, it looks like the stuff, I mean, I think the casting. Looks like him. It's just the most narcissistic thing I think I've ever when seen. when I first saw it. <laughs> I was like, um, uh, But I just Yeah, find but that's Carlo, I love that about him, yeah. that he's just like, I, I, you know, it's, it's seen it all before. It's, uh, you know, it's yeah. what he was doing before they sacked him last time. It's mm -hmm. just, you know, it's, it's an old idea that hasn't really moved on for me. Mm -hmm. I, I think it's, 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 I mean, I know it's three dimensional, but it's just quite one dimensional. I think, you know, it's like when Lee Roach was working there and, yeah. you know, Lee, Lee started there and has developed all sorts of new ideas, some of yeah. which are great, some of which aren't, but at yeah. least yeah. there's something. But, you know, I just, I just, it, it doesn't do, it washes. Do you not think there's a place they think, I think I find it interesting just as this proposition where you think about, you know, looking around London collections, when it is kind of laughable sometimes to see all the, the sort of peacocks in their suits with like, you know, so much fuss, like endless buttons and pocket mm. squares and an umbrella with a duck on it. And it, they just look ridiculous. And I found it quite it's interesting. Way to worse see. at Pity, do you yeah. know what oh, it's like, so much worse at Pity. But Pity, it's almost kind of like, you feel like it's almost a caricature. Whereas London, I think like. Oh no, mm. I think it's a caricature. Yeah, it is, but it's, it's I think I said, remember, it's London Collection Men's Not International Dress Like a Git Week. I saw that. I tweeted that. <laughs> <laughs> but it is interesting to see at least someone proposing that you can wear a suit. You know, you can be very sartorial, you can be very dressed up. But, but I think this is a, equally look. as far from the way people wear suits mm. as, as, as anything else. Yeah, because yeah. actually, yeah. you know, there isn't... Who is the guy that mm. dresses like that. I mean, I mean I there's, there's one look where it's just a single, sim simple, single-breasted jacket mm. with a scarf and a tie and a shirt, mm. which is perfectly fine. But what guy is, you know, and, and I know that their price point is mm. rising. I mean, they've just put the price of their bespoke up mm. an extraordinary amount. Mm. And, you know, they're trying to elevate the price point. But there just isn't, I don't know where it sits for me. It's, mm. it's, it's sort of an exercise in, you know, O level geometry gone a bit mad. Mm. And I think he, you know, he sort of is so, you know, it also slightly, you know, his attitude that he's the only man who works on Savile Row with a brain, frankly, winds me up mm. beyond all belief. And, um, but there we are. He, he is his own enigma. So this was your show of the season then. <laughs> yeah, but there we are, you know. <laughs> but otherwise, I liked it. <laughs> Alex, what was your take? Because you were kind of smiling and nodding. To no, I, 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 for me, I appreciate the aesthetic, um, and I think it's, I, I think very much what it is is an exercise in trying to make Kilgar stand for something different to yeah. other yeah, people. Yeah, yeah. You know, yeah. It does very well. You know, the yeah. image making, the consistency, the really store, the thing, yeah. all blend. Yeah. It, it, it hangs together very seamlessly, mm. but it's. But do you not think people will be seduced by it purely because of that kind of like forced modernity? You know, you, you but can't it doesn't feel it. modern. It feels like 90s modern. Yeah. It doesn't mm. feel like 2015 modern. What to you would feel like 2015 modern? Well, it on just the road? It, well, I don't know. I think this is the this is the difficulty with yeah. it. But as well, um, I think you, you when you keep saying the role because this isn't a bespoke proposition, is no, it? This, this is, is ready, to ready to wear. To wear. Yeah. Because yeah. then I think you know, for me, I, I actually see more of a validity, and I wonder if. I should see this as kind of a, a, an haute couture collection, whereas an haute couture collection is, you know, designers talk about them as propositions for the women, and mm. then you come in and you redesign yeah. the dress 
however you want it. And I would see this as a, a proposition. And then if a man does like that kind of, you know, it feels very Diorom. So if a man does like that Diorom, Gattaca, you know, sharpness, but actually wants to have something custom made on Savile Row, then he knows in the same way that if he wants, if, you know, he wants a sharp shoulder, he goes to Huntsman. He knows that if he yeah. wants, you know, something with, with no lapels that fastens with a safety pin, or, you know, paper clip, whatever, um, <laughs> that he, he goes to Kilgore for this yeah. look. Kind of and, with a paper But clip. I understand, <laughs> but you know, I could it's imagine magnet, it fastening with it. He does them with magnets. No. But I could imagine, <laughs> you know, if somebody wants that, then I, I could see this as kind of a bespoke proposition of yeah. this, is, this is what's possible. We can, you, you know, we can cut something incredibly sleek in this fashion that won't look like a traditional Savile Row suit, yeah. and that's yeah. what will seduce people in. But then why ready to wear? Do you think he's just doing it almost as an advert for the bespoke? Which I don't, I don't think he would be happy with that idea. I know that this idea of ready to wear. But it's really not, it's not an ad, I, I wouldn't call it an advert, I call it a proposition, which okay. is the idea of th this is what I can do. It's not, it's mm. not here's what, you know, it, it's not here's Kilga guys, it's here's, you know, here is a suit, <laughs> this is what we can do. Look at the seams, look at how, you know, beautifully made it is, and this is ready to wear. Yeah. And you know, if you want it bespoke, this is what we can do. Yeah. You know, what do you want? It's just interesting, isn't it, to think about this idea of smart dressing and dressing up? Because I feel like this is interesting to see here what you think about this, Steve. Because I think that this notion of being that slick and that polished it just feels really alien to a lot of young men. I think they would look at something like, you know, Lou Dalton or something like that, and, and almost think of that as kind of smart. You know, yeah. it's interesting just kind of to think about the relevance of different things. Mm. It's quite odd, when I was actually growing up and I used to actually um, read GQ, I was like a 14 year old kind of boy in, in Margate. Um, I, used to look, I, I used to look at, no, I used to look at Kilgore, especially the adverts, and I used to be quite excited by oh, them. They were yeah. beautiful. And I was always disappointed when I actually, when actually when I could possibly not afford them, but even, entertain the idea of being a customer I mean, yeah. almost being disappointed by it. Yeah. Mm. So I've always, I think I always feel unfulfilled but I've always felt unfulfilled by Kilgore and I think mm. we're continuing now. Mm. I mean I think it's it is the the Savile Row is having an interesting time because largely because you know you've got a big Chinese company that now owns four houses on the street. Yeah. Um, you know, Kilgal being one of them, Hardy yeah. Amy's being another, Geese and Hawks being the other. Spung and Liam Spung, Spung, it, yeah. Um, and they're clearly investing a lot of money into it. I mean, this is not inexpensive to do. This mm. level of cleanliness and, yeah. and 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 even just the store design, like oh, that Carrera yeah. marble, it's incredible. You know, he has a history of spending a lot of money on stores, and um, he hasn't disappointed his fans in that <laughs> department. But um, but they are trying. They're sort of trying to. I mean, what they've done with Hardy Amy's, uh, frankly, I think is a. You know, it, it it is so un the man. I mean, they now they I noticed I think their Twitter handle or their is this like Sir Hardy. I it, but it couldn't be so. It couldn't be any further from him. The the probably the greatest snob ever to <laughs> tread the pavements of Savile Row, and he was just. <laughs> You know, and then they've got sort of New Balance trainers with suits with jacquards in the window, yeah. and you know, a, 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 it just feels a bit sort of Jack Spade now. Yeah. And but they're clearly saying, well, we can't have three brands that sort of do the mm. same thing. We've got Gives yeah. that does that, and I think Gives, you know, of its again, I think Gives has polished itself and got itself looking like wearable, good clothing. Yeah. But then. You know, Hardy Amis has just been sort of, it's almost like, they've, well, we can't have Hardy Amis looking slick and thin. We can't have it looking like that. Yeah. What is it? Well, I don't know. But it, it, it really disappoints me. And I think it's, it's dangerous for, you know, Savile Row stands for something very elevated. And they're clearly, Lee and Fung understand that they can make money from the moniker. Yeah. And I think that is, you know, it's dangerous for, for those of us, you know, Norton and Sons is still just a bespoke house on Savile Row. Yeah. We live and die by people thinking that Savile Row is the... The, the sort of ultimate in where to go for a suit. Yeah. And if all of a sudden there are, you know, 100,000 suits a year, you know, made somewhere else with the Savile Row name, then actually we all, you know, end up out of a job. Do you think it's a, a, a worrying time then for? I think it is. I mean, it's, it does worry me a bit, actually, um, because it's never been exploited in the way it's being sort of exploited now, I don't mm. think. Um, and you know, it's a, it is an interesting time. You know, we, we you know, it's a very closed community, and everybody knows everybody else's business. Mm. You know, we know how many bespoke suits are being ordered there. We know how many are being ordered at all the other yeah. houses because the tailors are self-employed, and when they haven't got work from there, they're knocking on our door. Mm. Um, so it is. It's you know, it's. Uh, it, I think it'll be interesting to see how Savile Row retains an identity thirty mm. years from now. What does it mean? I think it doesn't mean what it means now if, if it follows mm. this path. 
To move on to a very different aesthetic, let's end with a bang with Moschino. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to miss Moschino. I saw it at the beginning and it hasn't come back. Maybe <laughs> we've missed it. Do you know if ID's a big fan of Moschino, no? Jeremy, yeah, and Moschino too. Yeah, we are. As, as a magazine, we're, we're super behind it. Um, for me, it was I mean, because London menswear is so slick and so focused this season, it kind of felt even more kind of as an alien kind of experience. But in a way, I quite like that because it was kind of so far away. I didn't know where I was. I could be, I could be sitting in, I was just sitting in kind of Jeremy's Snow. imagination. <laughs> yeah, it was quite an odd, odd experience. I wasn't at the show actually. It was, it was a hotly contested ticket in the office. And I was like, oh, I can sit this one out and watch it from, from afar and be kind of, yeah, dazzled by it. <laughs> but, but it is um, one of the few shows where, you know, it's one of those shows where staging is a big part. Yeah. I mean, most of what we've been talking about in London is it's shown on a uniform. It's clothes. Yeah. It's clothes yeah. that we're yeah. talking about, yeah. and which is lovely because a lot of shows that you go to in other cities actually people are, you yeah. know, taking photographs of the roof and the yeah. set and everything but the clothes. Yeah. You know, this is a full package that you know, and it's fairly rare. I mean, really, mm. and even Burberry don't do. I mean, no, they do a big production, yeah. but they yeah. don't. It's not. It's not the set that's yeah. making. You know, the set is a big part of this one. It's one yeah. of the few that. That has it and is kind yeah. of fun to, to see in general. Yeah, so it feels like a bit of an anomaly, doesn't it, for that? Which is interesting you say that. You don't like talking about the ski do you? Not particularly, no. I do well, it's, to close to, it's close to <laughs> Alex's heart, the, yeah. the brand. I mean, well, for me, it's all it is. It's, it feels so much so Jeremy. Yeah. And yeah, less, less so Mos Moschino, but I don't know. What do you think from looking at the pictures? <laughs> Pardon? <Not> really. <laughs> I mean,. <laughs> It's fine, you know, it's like, it's a winter collection. There's not many shirts. Like, yeah. there was this weird thing with winter collections. Oh, he's going to be cold in that. You did tweet, you did tweet about, yeah, the, the lack of um, tops the, the lack in of London. But there are these weird Adequate. trends. We talked yeah. about that. Was it you that was talking about that there's like, no shirt, displaced neck hole. Like really weirdly mm. specific trends, isn't it? It was a weird season for that. So what was the highlight of London then? I'm oh, dropping all my notes. If, it not, if not Moschino, was it Craig? Is it wrong to think of it as like one designer? Was it a good season? Was I think it it's wrong to think of it as, as yeah. one designer. Um, you know, I, I, I think it's, it's wrong with any city to try and boil it down to one designer. Because I think- the man that goes, I only go to Milan for Prada. <laughs> no, but I don't, you know. <laughs> you know, I make big grand statements like that, but then, you know, I, I love Versace. Um, I loved Xenia this season, yeah, you know, I thought, um, but I'm not going to just talk about Milan, you just but you know, slide into our Milan <laughs> Bottega <laughs> menswear was great, you know, there's lot, I, you know, <clears throat> I, I think it's very dangerous to be like, oh, well, th this is the one thing that was the best, and yeah. this is the one thing that overshadowed everything else, unless it's a, unless it's a very, very clear show that really overpowered everything mm. else. I think, it, you know, but kind explain of the, your the thing identity that, comment then. Well, I think actually you said that I said Paris had an identity. I don't think Paris has an identity. I said that Florence has an identity okay. and yeah. that, that Milan has an identity. And I think London's men's identity used to be purely Savile Row, but I think since London Collections Men yeah. has actually grown, it, the interesting thing is the fact that it has this kind of fragmented identity. Sure. Um, but then again, also that that sort of happened, you know, with, with, with punk as well, that you yeah. know, that the, there became this break between sort of tradition and uh, and what kind of younger people were doing, younger designers, mm. younger creatives. Um, so I, I think saying that it's not easy to pin it down isn't a bad thing. Yeah, maybe that's that is London style history is that diversity and that eclecticism and yeah. that's what I, makes it. Great. I think it's really nice that you could go from you know you could go from seeing Patrick's show to seeing Craig's show. Um, you know, then someone could go and see Moschino. The, the fact that, you know, then you go to Burberry, the fact that you have that dichotomy, yeah. all those different things, and that there will be odd things that, that different shows share, but that it, you're not just looking at a, a single homogenous vision. Sometimes you go to, you know, for instance, when you go to Pity, it's a trade fair, and you go and it's, it's predominantly suits. Um, there was a season when I went to Milan and it was, pre you know, it was suits on every single yeah. catwalk, and that was the only thing that people were showing. Um, but I don't think you'd ever get that with London. No. The, the same way you'd never yeah. get that with Paris. There's, there's too much yeah. breadth in, yeah. in the offering for men's and women's in Paris. I don't think you'd ever go and, and see a, a season on a single note. And mm. that's, I think that's the really great thing. And that's actually how London Collections Men's has carved out this place for itself. It is by the fact that it's not just, it's not just one note, it's not just one theme. Mm. It's got such a, a kind of 
variety to, to what designers are offering. Well, that's a nicer note as any to end on, then, isn't it? You're both nodding along really I've got to write something about London Collections, man, so I'm just thinking Well, you can just transscribe that. That was really good. There you go, done. Well, that's very yeah. interesting. Well, should we give all of the amazing designers, and Patrick, because you're here with us. Yeah. Um, so I'll I give know. Patrick a round of applause. Yeah, let's give Patrick a round of applause <laughs> to round things up. <laughs>